life after stroke, understanding a stroke. Mary and Peter, my son, got out of the car and um, so I got out of the back seat and stood up behind them and, uh, and then I just felt so faint I could hardly stand there. I just started to crumple to the ground as though I was sort of going under an anaesthetic. I felt a little strange when I was paralysed and uh, I lay there for about an hour and a half and then I finally got move, moving back and um, got to the phone and rang her. She came home and um, by the time she got home we had another one and after two of them I just decided the best we go to the hospital. What is a stroke? A stroke is not one single entity, it's made up of a number of conditions. The most common we call an ischemic stroke, that's when there's a blockage to a blood vessel and the part of the brain that's fed by that blood vessel is starved of oxygen and if the blockage lasts long enough that part of the brain dies. That's the most common form of stroke we see. The less common are the hemorrhages where a blood vessel bursts or bleeds and then the high pressure of the blood going into the brain causes damage. And the third main type, usually in younger people, is the subarachnoid hemorrhage, when an aneurysm or a weak area in the blood vessel balloons out and bursts, and they have a different sort of hemorrhage that can cause spasm of blood vessels and also lead to a stroke. Treatment available in hospital. In the first few days in hospital, we're particularly interested in confirming the diagnosis that it is a stroke, and that's done largely on clinical grounds, and increasingly we'll use a CT scan of the head to help determine where and what type of stroke it is, and mainly also to exclude other things that can sometimes mimic stroke. We're interested in full clinical examination to determine which parts of the brain have been involved, in other words, which parts of the body are not working, that may be obvious if you're paralysed on one side, but can be a bit more difficult if there is visual impairment or you know, complicated motor skills, you know, dressing ability, those sort of areas. OK, I'll just do one more. What's this number? Four. Very good. Let's try another one here. Number one, first and foremost, get the diagnosis right. Secondly, instituting therapy as soon as possible. Now, some of that therapy may be medical th treatment. Um, secondly, um, it's nursing treatment, because often what can happen after a stroke is that there's problems swallowing, and, um, and that puts the, the person at risk of um, aspirating some of the fluid into their lungs and putting them at risk of pneumonia. Um, if a limb is uh, paralysed, there's the risk that um, there may be dragging of the limb on joints, particularly the shoulder joints, so the risk of injury and falls. Um, often after a stroke there's confusion, difficulty understanding um, parts of their, uh, the person's surroundings so that they may misjudge distances and where they're walking and again putting them at risk of injury. Right. Very good. At this stage, there is no universally accepted, easily applied treatment for stroke. So once you've had your stroke, how well you do to a certain extent is to nature and, and luck. The bigger the stroke, the less likely you are to do well. So, so to a certain extent in the early days, there's a little bit of waiting to see whether you're going to make a natural recovery or not. And then we can work with what recovery is happening. The difficulty for us is some patients will come in paralysed down one side and within 24 hours they'll be up and about and walking. Other patients with the same paralysis a week later are making progress and will go through a couple of months of rehabilitation and other patients will make no progress at all and remain paralysed. So the early days are uncertain days for us as well as for the patient and family. The biggest thing to learn is you can't fix a stroke. That was the biggest lesson to me. There is no cure for a stroke. You can't put it right. I always thought that I could overcome anything. I always thought you'd have no chance to put it right. But with a stroke, all you can do is rehabilitate, but it doesn't cure a stroke. In general terms, um, having a stroke 
does put you at risk of further strokes and therefore we need to look at ways and means of reducing that risk. We tend to talk about risk factors that increase your chance of having a stroke. The most important one is the one we can't do anything about and that's increasing age. The risk factors we're most interested in are the ones that we can influence and they are things like high blood pressure, diabetes, cigarette smoking and uh, irregular heartbeat, a term we call atrial fibrillation. There are treatments for, for most of those conditions which will reduce people's risk of having a stroke. And that's one of the reasons why we particularly want to find these things out early or particularly get involved with people who've had mini strokes or warning strokes to try and prevent the big one coming. Effects of stroke. The reason why strokes affect different parts of the body for different people is to do with which blood vessels involved. The brain's a specialised organ, it's not like the heart where most of it just acts as a muscle as a pump. Different parts of the brain have evolved to do different things. So we have a speech area, we have an area that controls vision to the left, another area that controls vision to the right, and the same for power, for sensation, and the different types of sensation. So if you have a small blood vessel that just feeds the part of the brain that controls speech that is blocked in a stroke, then you're going to lose the power of speech or, and possibly understanding. A different person, a different blood vessel affecting the part of the brain that controls power in the left arm and leg, again that will result in a paralysis of the left side. So people can have a wide range of strokes purely because it depends on which blood vessel the narrowings occurred in or which blood vessel the clot has gone to and caused the blockage. For the same reason people can have multiple strokes over a period of years and have different parts of their body affected at different occasions. Effects of stroke, communication. Sometimes it may be that a person loses the ability to speak and to communicate in an effective way. So that at the very time when they're experiencing all these stresses and uh, worries, they're unable to communicate that, uh, not only to the family, but, but also to the people that are looking after them. So that's very frustrating. They knew I could blink one for a yes, two for a no, so questions were asked. And if the question was asked and another question was the answer to me, I didn't know which one to answer. And then when I thought I was blink, blinking right, I was automatically blink as well. So they, they were getting varied sort of you know, ans answers. Very, very difficult to tell people something was wrong. Um, for example, I had a, an airway pushed in my mouth to keep my tongue in a place so I could breathe. And there's all different sizes of these. And one day it was taken out to clean, another one put back in with no one looking at the size. And it was a different one and it wouldn't stay there. There's no way I could tell them it was wrong. Because how do you answer yes or no on something that is wrong when they don't ask you? So I had to sort of persevere and try and hold it there to breathe. Effects of stroke, swallowing. Sometimes there is difficulty in swallowing after a stroke. And it's very important that until people's swallow has been assessed uh, okay. by a speech okay. therapist or by someone else that's trained in the technique, okay. that people don't okay. eat or drink anything. Uh, so that can appear uncaring unless it's explained to the stroke patient. The reason we don't give people food or water before they have a swallowing assessment is that if the food or water goes down the wrong way, it can go into the lungs and they can get a pneumonia and that will retard their progress. They have crumbs but they actually don't feel them. Okay, that's great. That's great. Effects of stroke, perception. Patients have difficulty in the relationship of themselves and other people or items in their environment. So that, for example, it may be difficult for a patient to judge the appropriate relationship of items and the space very near to them 
or in the medium distance or further away. It can involve problems in depth perception, in judging Five. the yep. height of a step, for example. Here, good. Fire. Good. Here, good. I remember it. I, I was more aware of the right side than anything else. Um, and wasn't taking any, any notice of anything on my left side. Uh, not that I couldn't see it, but I just wasn't aware of it. And um, so uh, then I can remember the next thing I remember was, uh, so I was sitting propped up in this bed, and I could hear Mary and Peter talking. But they weren't in the room anywhere. I couldn't see them or, or find them anywhere. And they were talking away to me, and telling me how they'd brought this wonderful, uh, rich, thick vegetable soup up to me, because the vegetable soup was very, very good for curing strokes. And uh, how on earth they ever got that idea, I don't know, but um, uh, some neighbour had told them that. And anyway, I remember Mary saying, come on, pay attention and open your mouth and swallow this soup off the spoon. So I couldn't find them anywhere, so I didn't know where to look for the spoon. And uh, then I remember it, across the foot of the bed, uh, my son Peter, who's a fairly tall fella, sort of just, just appeared. He, he sort of went put, put together like all the little pixels on a, on a computer screen. He just... Um, uh, composed himself across a sort of wriggly line at the end of the bed and just sort of appeared and came around to my right side and explained to me who, what, what, the, what the deep, deep we were doing and what the soup was all about sort of thing. So I had a bit of a conversation with him and he seemed much, much happier then and uh, so he, went, he obviously went back off around the other side to where Mary was sitting and, um, and so as he went, he went, um, he sort of uh, disintegrated as he went across this wriggly line at the foot of the bed and he just sort of completely evaporated and went round to the other side, and then I could hear, hear both of them talking again. And I, could, I was aware of everything on the right side of the room, and I, I could see everything, and I was aware of everything over there. But I'd lost Peter. He'd, he just vanished again, because I had this total unawareness of, of anything on my, on my left side. So it's very, very important that these sometimes rather subtle perceptual problems are assessed by the medical and nursing staff and by the therapy staff, and that they are discussed with the patient and their family. And once families understand what the problem is, then all, all, the, all the stress, all the difficulty uh, goes out of the situation, and that's very helpful. You know, they dress themselves in all these strange clothing. Leave it. Just leave them, because as far as they're concerned, that's where they're at, and they feel comfortable with what they've dressed themselves in. Yeah. Whereas with Dad, knowing that all his life he's been a smart, snazzy dresser, and when I see him walk out of the room and he's got uh, underpants outside of his track pants, and he's got two pairs of shoes on, because he's got his sneakers and he's slipped them inside his um, scuffs, and he's walking around like that, and, he <laughs> and it's hot as anything, and he's got three jerseys and a jacket on, plus he's got two hats on his head, you know, and I, well, straight away I turn around and say, what are you doing with it? Oh, you take that off, you don't need that, and he's fighting with me, you see, because he wants to keep his blinging jerseys on, even though it's sweltering, and he's sweating. But according to others that have cared for their own, you know, just leave them. And they'll feel the heat. You know, you just let them know, gee whiz, it's a hot day today, Dad, look at me, I'm just in something cool. And then it's good for them, it's healthy for them to look and click and then do, you know, do for themselves. And that's what he did, yeah. Effects of stroke, incontinence. A common consequence of having a moderate to severe stroke is incontinence of urine and that's where you can't either pass your urine or you can't control when or how you pass urine and incontinence of urine is, is very embarrassing it's very embarrassing socially and for many patients they find that that loss of dignity is very painful it's a common problem it's a problem that the health carers that are looking after you are aware of we have ways of investigating it, of managing it, and for most people it does improve very considerably. But again, it's one of the areas of loss of control which exacerbates all those uh, feelings that you have when you have a stroke. You know that they're humiliated sitting there in a wheelchair as Bruce was, um, incontinent. Uh, I had to lift him onto the toilet. 
uh, lift him off again, back into bed and all that, which he hated. But you had to treat him with respect because he was an adult. And that takes quite a bit of emotional juggling. Effects of stroke, motor power. Early on in the stroke, the motor power to the legs, to the arms may be affected. And that is one of the areas of stroke that frequently does improve over time. But when such an event has happened to a patient, it's very difficult for them to actually believe the doctors, believe the nurses that improvement will happen. Now let's have a look and see what you can do with your legs. So you can, can you lift this leg up? Good, and down again. What about this one? Can you bring this leg up? That's good. Good, excellent, excellent. Archie's big toe moved, and That's that was right. the first voluntary movement he'd had. So we put a blue sticker on his toe, yep. one of those quick sticks, and everybody that came into the room, the toe would be waved at them. <laughs> um, and that was the big breakthrough. That was the first voluntary movement. And after I had left, sort of left Ward 58 after a, a bit over a month, I was able to talk eat food, food in my mouth. Um, and I was able to hold my hand, head up, move my legs and um, one, uh, one hand. Effects of stroke, emotions. Emotional lability is a, co a problem that we find quite commonly in stroke patients. What it is, is when the emotion that the stroke patient feels is different to the emotion that they express, or that the emotion that they express is, is heightened. You have changed mentally in your way of thinking, uh, your temper, sometimes you get very emotional, you cry for nothing, well you think you cry for nothing. I still cry for a lot at times, you know, when I get emotional, but after I cry, I feel much better afterwards. So your family has to be told of all these sort of things. And it's no use me telling them because they say, oh, mum's only making it all up. It's better for your doctor to tell, talk to the family all about everything about stroke. Once an explanation is, is given, both uh, to the person with stroke and to their families, we generally find that people do cope with this as long as they have an explanation and can understand that the emotion displayed doesn't necessarily mean that there is that emotion being felt. Feelings following a stroke, the grieving process. Certainly I think to perhaps go to sleep and wake up and discover that everything's changed, that the person that you thought you were is no longer there. Um, must be really, really frightening. So that, um, actually someone described it to me as like the body snatchers have been in and someone else is inhabiting my body. That all my reactions, all the things that I normally do, they don't work. I can't think clearly, I can't concentrate. Perhaps even that they can't speak or can't comprehend what people are saying. So I imagine the first reaction is one of real fear as to what's happened. First time I saw Archie in his room, all I noticed was the fear in his eyes. He had those two eyes and he really, to me, looked absolutely fear stricken, just the eyes. He couldn't say anything, but his eyes followed me around everywhere and there was sheer terror in them. Later on, when awareness of what happens is, there's obviously going to be a huge um, grieving for loss of abilities, just as there is with anyone who's had a, a life-changing event. And so there's grieving, there's a whole grieving process that a person goes through, often starting with denying that it's happened, like I haven't had a stroke, the doctors are telling me I've had a stroke, but I haven't really, um, they've got it wrong. And then when a person accepts what has happened to them, 
then of course they're very unhappy, very depressed. And at that stage, or a little bit beyond that, they get angry. Why did this happen to me? My brother-in-law smokes 50 cigarettes a day. It hasn't happened to him. Um, I've always got exercise. It's not. It's just not fair. And then often it goes on to an idealisation, like everything was great. <laughs> That's not true of any of our lives, but it's an idealisation of how life was previously, before they actually come to accept it. You still say, why me? You do. Uh, there is anger, there's mood changes that all come, they're all part of the stroke recovery. The grief. Uh, the grief is a funny thing where it comes out. Everybody goes through grief. You're, I think fairly permanently your emotions stay very close to the surface. Anger's a natural reaction. Yep, you're allowed to be angry. No problem with being angry. Where anger does become a problem is when you don't have control over it, when it, um, it pops out too often and lasts for too long. So it's, the problem doesn't come with anger, it comes with what you do with that anger. It's a physical emotion, like we need to do something, whether it's banging a table at something or shout, there's a, it needs to have a physical release in some way or another. And because people have had a stroke, often they're physically not able to do the kinds of things they were before if they were people that used to bang around cupboards and slam doors, they maybe can't get up and do that. Come here. I'll go out in the garden and start doing something out there. Uh, we'll grab the dogs, take them up, we're going for a walk. Mm. And just head off down to the beach. And then it sort of takes my mind off it. OK. Come on. Depression is one of the commonest problems that people with stroke may experience. And it can hit them like a bombshell. And they feel that they've got over the immediate effects of the stroke. The family feel that they've got over the effects. And then all of a sudden, their world falls apart with depression. And it's very important that everybody around them and family are involved in this, supports them, helps them through this period. It's a big strain because um, a stroke brings mood swings. And at times you hate yourself, especially in the early days while your, your brain's settling down again, while it gets over the bruising, you find yourself, your mood swings. You can't explain them. You don't even spot them coming. It's physically difficult and it's emotionally difficult because suddenly your whole life changes. Um, you suddenly become very dependent on people. Suddenly you can't do the things you used to do. Your mobility is different, your, your manoeuvrability is different. All of a sudden I'm in a wheelchair and um, it was hard, it was really hard. And you go through a, a phase of, um, you grieve, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like, you know, there's a death in the family. You know, it upsets you and you, you grieve. And so I went through that phase for the first couple of years. But um, so eventually you sort of come right, it takes a while. It's just time, it takes time to get over it. Getting information. It's a lot for the individual and families to come to terms with. Uh, stroke is a very complex uh, disease and um, often requires information to be delivered to patients and family members uh, in a variety of different ways and it's often got to be repeated and it's often got to be given by different people uh, to sink in. It's a lot to understand. A lot of that early information that families receive, they won't remember. Uh, it's a time of stress and it's quite normal to really have a blur as to what the doctor told you the other night when your loved one came into hospital. Don't worry, it's in really important for families to ask the questions again, uh, get some more information, hear it from somebody else, hear it from a different perspective. 
Uh, it helps in the communication often if there's one key person in the hospital team that the family can talk to. And the reverse of that is also true. It often helps if the hospital staff have got one member in the family that they can use as their primary uh, communication. Well, usually what we do when we uh, start off working with a person, uh, we introduce ourselves as to who we are and what our role is and we have one person on the team who's the key worker who becomes the intermediary because often it can be very confusing for a person to have names, faces, titles, a whole whole new education really. <laughs> having a stroke involves having a whole education of how the rehabilitation system works. So you've got to keep educating but you've got to keep repeating it because They'll hear what they want to hear, You're right. particularly yeah. to start with, and that's all they'll hear, mm -hmm. and they won't hear the other things. So it's, they're desperate for answers. They're absolutely desperate. How long is he going to be in hospital? Is he going to ever talk again? You know, and you can't give those answers. The most important thing is not to take hope away, um, because we don't know, and they must have that hope to hold on to, particularly the stroke person. For more information or assistance, please contact your local Stroke Foundation office or ring 0800 Stroke 0800 787 653.